And today's lesson is all about deciduous fruit tree care, specifically the pomegranate fruit tree. It's late winter, early fall, and the leaves on your tree may be falling or you may have no leaves at all. We're going to discuss if this is something you should be worried about. Should you be fertilizing your trees in the winter? Backyard orchard culture, in ground versus in container versus espalier, and so many other different ways of training your fruit trees to succeed in your backyard orchard. Are my trees propagated by way of grafting or by way of cutting? And what's the difference in the ideal grow zones for your pomegranate fruit trees, as well as drought tolerance? Today, we're fortunate to have with us plant expert Tom Spellman of Dave Wilson Nursery. Dave Wilson Nursery is the leading distributor of deciduous fruit trees in the nation. If the Amazon is the lungs of the planet, Dave Wilson Nursery is our nation's lungs and our fruit tree go-to source. And I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by that. I hope you enjoy this lesson on deciduous fruit tree care, specifically the pomegranate. Hi, my name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Gains, where we grow cool plants. And today we have the honor and privilege of being here with Tom Spellman, the leading educator of the Fruit Tube YouTube channel and Dave Wilson Nursery. Thank you so very much, Tom, for being with us today. It's my pleasure, Charles. Always a pleasure to work with you. Yeah, we've been able to share so much great content with our audience over the years, ranging from Apple tree care to meeting in the Zager hybrid fruit tree orchard in Northern California, and even the experimental lot at the Dave Wilson Nursery, um, again, also up in Northern California, and just shared so much educational, informative content with our viewers. And thank you so much for all that we've been able to bring to our audience. And today we're going to be dealing with specifically the pomegranate fruit tree. My favorite categories, you know, for a nice, uh, nice uh, early uh, fall into winter fruit variety. So I mentioned earlier that the Amazon is the lungs of the world and that Dave Wilson Nursery is really part of these lungs in the sense of adding greenery, adding um, this coolness effect that trees bring to the, you know, to the environment, cleaning the air, removing pollution and so much more. And the reason I say Dave Wilson Nursery is so impactful as the Amazon forest is, is aside from also being the source for hundreds, if not thousands of variety of delicious fruits, is you guys are selling upwards in the millions. Um, and I wanted you to hopefully share with um, our viewers, how many million trees are we dealing with on an annual basis? Well, it varies from year to year, but this year it's going to be about um, 11 and a half to 12 million trees. That's great. And that's another 11 and 12 million more fruit trees that are going to be planted across the country and around the world helping to make this planet, you know, that much healthier and cleaner for us all. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. You know, we're selling um, a fair amount of material to the commercial farmers, you know, fruit farmers, and we're also selling, you know, hundreds of thousands of trees back into the uh, retail and wholesale um, nurseries throughout the United States, both uh, fruit trees, nut trees, and shade trees as well. That's beautiful. So I just wanted to share with our audience that November, we have been highlighting the value of integrating the pomegranate tree to the backyard orchard. And most people are only familiar with one variety of pomegranate when going to the local nursery or shopping most grocery stores. But we wanted to share with the world, those especially obviously viewing in, in learning from the Ivory Organics YouTube channel, that there are more than just one variety of pomegranates. And there's actually a lot of delicious choices and I'm proud to share that Ivory Organics has partnered up with Dave Wilson Nursery in making available some delicious flavor variety pomegranates. Um, in addition to, I guess, again, the world's most famous, most popular is the wonderful pomegranate. And I was hoping you can share with the audience the difference between the wonderful variety compared to we also selected that our audience would be interested in the Parfianca. And third, and by far not least, the Eversweet variety pomegranate. Can you share a little brief description about each of the three varieties and what's so unique about each of them? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the variety, the first variety you discussed, wonderful, is probably the most well-known pomegranate variety. It's been on the market for well over 100 years. 
Uh, it is a very productive tree. It's a bright red fruit with a bright red arrow. It uh, does have a, and the fruit can be a little bit on the astringent side, but it, you know, it's the one that is most uh, commercially marketed today. And they use it a lot uh, for juicing. So when you go to uh, the grocery store and you buy Palm Wonderful pomegranate juice, it's going to be, you know, 90 or 95 percent the variety wonderful. When you're buying a pomegranate in the grocery store around the holidays, it's about 95 percent that it's going to be that variety wonderful. So your commercial uh, variety that's still very, very popular and very valuable on the market. So one of the things that we at Dave Wilson Nursery have been very lucky to be able to provide are some of the varieties out of the UC Davis uh, Wolfscope collection. And they have about two varieties in their collection. And, and, and the, over the last 20 years, I've been through the collection a half a dozen times and been able to sample pretty much all 240. So wow. um, Davis was lucky in that in the 1960s and, and early 70s, they were able to trade varieties with a man by the name of Dr. Gregory Levin. And Dr. Levin was the curator of the Gariella Research Station in Turkmenistan. And over 20 or 30 or 40 years before, he had been uh, collecting pomegranate varieties in the So Levin had about a thousand different selections in, in his collection, which is pretty amazing uh, to think that there are a thousand different pomegranate varieties that all have some sort of a distinct characteristic. And um, one of the things that Levin did was he offered UC Davis some of his favorites. And um, the, the variety that that I love, Parfidanka, was uh, Dr. Levin's favorite variety out of his collection. And, and you know, that says a lot when you can say, I've got a thousand different varieties and this one is my favorite. I, you know, I thought, well, why is that your favorite? And it's, it's a big fruit. It's brightly colored. It has a non-detectable, very soft seed. It has a large arrow and it doesn't have the astringency that some of the other dark red flesh varieties like Wonderful uh, have. So it has a very, very distinct flavor and a very delicious flavor. So uh, I understand why Levin rated it as his number one variety. And uh, quite frankly, I would al always find it hard to say that I like Wonderly Ask, well, what week are you talking about ripeness? But when it comes to pomegranates, I'm in agreement with Dr. Levin. I think Parfianca <laughs> is about as good as you're going to get. Now, the variety Eversweet is a variety that's been around for a number of years, and its attribute or attributes are, again, a, a very sweet flavor, a non-detectable, very soft seed, and it's a lightly colored variety. It's kind of a whitish to pinkish uh, flesh. It doesn't have the deep, intense red color that a par Parfianca or Wonderful would have for one reason. It's non-staining. So where the dark red varieties would certainly be staining, Eversweet is, is sweet, uh, completely edible kernel, and uh, non-staining. Now, that being said, the uh, antioxidant value is probably not quite as high as some of the dark red varieties like Wonderful and Parfianca, but uh, kids love it. I mean, you know, my kids used to sit there and just pull those apart and, and eat them until they were completely gone. And, you know, there's no hard seed to break your teeth. So all four, all three of them right now all have their own attributes and, and you know, they're, they're all good for their own purpose. So I, I, I like all three of those selections. And we're so excited to be bringing again all of those three delicious flavors as you can see and learn and they're available now at ivyorganics.com. One of the questions a few of our customers have already had is it's now late November going into December and the trees are looking yellow. Just to share with you, the container size is about a four by four on the top, square by 12 inches deep, and the plant is about 18 inches tall. So Right now, here we are late November, the plant's looking yellow. Some of them have no leaves at all. Does this mean that my plant is ill? Can you explain what's happening with my, the hint is deciduous pomegranate tree. <laughs> right, and, and and that is simply all it is, is, is the fact that the tree is going to sleep for the winter. So it's gonna, all the foliage is gonna yellow, all that foliage is gonna drop off, and the tree takes its winter nap. And that will, that will last until about more. March and in, in March, we set a foliage and, and in turn when the weather and the night temps warm up a little bit more, May, June, it'll start to bloom and, and set its crop for uh, fall 2023. So just to reiterate, just wanted to make sure that if the plant has no leaves on it, we can assume, at least for the time being, that the plant is completely healthy and we can expect it to grow throughout spring and, and even more so in the summer. 
Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. You know, the, the lack of foliage right now is uh, has nothing to do with the health of the plant. It's just it's it went for the winter. So the next question I get asked a lot is, are pomegranates easy to grow? If you want to share their grow zone, water requirements, drought tolerance, give us a little bit of background about how easier or hard pomegranates are to integrate into the backyard home orchard. Actually, pomegranate is a, is a very, very versatile plant. I mean, it can be trained in any one of a, a, a number of different forms and, and can be grown in many locations in, in the garden, in the landscape. I think the things that are too important are uh, they, they're they naturally a plant from the desert. You know, they're from the deserts in the Middle East and China and all up, uh, uh, you know, through uh, that area. And uh, they will thrive with little or no water once they're established. But that being said, uh, in order to manage a good, uh, high-quality fruit crop, the regular irrigations through the summer would certainly be recommended. You know, you can certainly grow the tree without a lot of water, but if you want a healthy fruit crop, you're going to irrigate on, on a regular uh, hot, full sun locations are fine. The soil could be um, either a, a fast, sandy, fast rain soil or a, a heavier type clay soil. They're, they're very versatile as far as their uh, adaptability to different soil types. So I guess the most important thing is keep it out of the shade. Keep it somewhere, you know, where it's going to get a, a full sun location and just irrigate regularly as you would other fruit trees to get a good quality crop up. So another question we get asked quite often is, do I need to fertilize my pomegranate or any other deciduous fruit trees in the winter? Well, um, I'm not a big advocate of feeding right, you know, right now or right in the dead of winter, but I like to put my first application on about the end of January, you know, about three, four weeks before the trees are waking up. So this is, this is their breakfast, you know, this is going to be the first meal of the season and that's going to be available to them when they start to break dormancy the root systems activate nutrients and you've, you've already given them breakfast a few weeks before so i think that end of january first of february window is probably the best opportunity to start to feed your fruit trees for the season just to share with people across the country um when it comes to a late january early february application for us here in southern california i know specifically my particular grow zone our last chance to frost if there is one is that last week of january so most plants start pulling out of dormancy, especially my pomegranate tree is one of the first ones to break dormancy in the backyard. Um, and then shortly thereafter, within another week or two thereafter, some of my fruit trees will begin blooming. Um, so again, that does make sense to have a light application of fertilizer prepared in your garden soil that late, you know, week of January, first week of February um, to start getting the microorganism, the biomes, and and those elements readily available for those plants. Another important question I get asked a lot is, are these pomegranate trees grafted? And also, just in general, a lot of fruit trees you get from any nursery typically might be grafted. For example, a navel orange on a flying dragon rootstock. Granny Smith apples might be grafted on an M11 for a semi-dwarf effect or on an M9 for a complete dwarf effect. So um, are these pomegranates grafted in a way that would control its height or drought tolerance or whatever it is that that rootstock could potentially offer these pomegranates? And if you can explain you know, how they're propagated, is it by way of grafting or cutting? And what are the advantages of, of the decision made by Dave Wilson Nursery? Sure. Um, and grafting is always done for a purpose. And, the, and nine out of 10 times, the purpose is going to be you have a variety that isn't, um, it doesn't root well in its own, that needs a rootstock that's adaptable to a specific climate or a specific soil type. So, you know, we would uh, graft a uh, Santa Rosa plum tree on rootstocks that are adaptable to sandy desert conditions. We would graft it on a uh, rootstock that's adaptable to heavier wetter coastal soils. We would adapt, uh, graft it onto a rootstock that we, would be adaptable to uh, northern climates like uh, like Idaho. So, the, the, you know, there's there's four or five or six different rootstocks that we would use for most fruit. Fortunately for us, there are a few different varieties, uh, specifically figs and pomegranates, that have a very healthy, stable root system under almost any condition. So, we weren't, we weren't really having to provide a rootstock for adaptabilities to weather or to soil. Uh, we weren't, you know, we weren't looking for a rootstock that was going to give us a semi-dwarfing 
attributes because pomegranates are going to be on the small side to begin with anyway, and they're very easily kept. So what we were looking for was just uh, stability and health. And pomegranates on their own root, grown from a either a hardwood cutting in the winter or from a softwood cutting in the spring, pomegranates are very healthy on their own root. So we've never really we've never really seen a reason where we needed to graft a pomegranate. Excellent explanation. And another um, plus that comes to mind is in regards to grow zone. I know there's a lot of growers out there that try to grow things that are not necessarily suitable for their grow zone, but yet they somehow, you know, manage to succeed or they just struggle with, you know, just growing some things just for the excitement of being able to grow them. Pomegranates, I know the majority of them are grow zone seven to 10. And I know there's some exceptions um, to the rule with other varieties of pomegranates if you want to share. But one of the cool things I'm thinking about with the fact that pomegranates are not grafted is in the event that there's dieback and if there's any sucker growth that comes off of the roots that may be protected by even that blanket of snow and that, and that ground temperature that's just warm enough that it keeps the roots alive when the tree may have frozen over, especially for those growing in colder climates, that all of that sucker growth can potentially grow back to become another you know, highly productive, exact, genetically identical, delicious tasting pomegranate variety, because again, it's grown on the same root stock, the same root as that parent tree. That's exactly it. So, and, and pomegranates and figs both fall into that category. So if you do, if you are growing in a climate that is colder than a, than a zone seven or a zone six, and you do get, if you're insulating that ground layer, uh, you can all, you'll always get growth coming back and it will always be true to type on either figs or pomegranate. So that's definitely an attribute where if I lost, uh, a navel orange tree due to a winter freeze and it came back from the rootstock, the rootstock is going to be completely worthless as far as its fruit value. So pomegranate, that's definitely a plus for pomegranates. So when it comes to growing pomegranates, are pomegranates best suited for being in ground, container life? Are there other recommendations you have in regards to how pomegranates should be planted just in general? Well, they're, they're very versatile as far as that goes. You know, you can, you can plant them and train them into areas in your landscape where you would never consider that you could grow a fruit tree. I've seen many, many beautifully planted in an 18 inch or two foot wide planter box and a spellyard. They, you know, they make a great plant on a trellis. The blooms are, are beautiful, bright orange red and the fruit hang on there like little, Christmas ornaments, you know, right into the fall season. So it, it, it's a wonderful plant to work with as a hedgerow or as an espalier. Uh, you can also grow it as a, uh, a single trunk tree form, but pomegranates really want to be a, a shrub or a bush. They want to, they want to multiply right from the base. And since they're grown vegetatively from hardwood cut, absolutely grow them out, you know, as a multi from the base and every stem will be true to type. Uh, as a container plant, I think for, you know, a limited period of time in a container, probably somewhere between three years and five years, maybe up to six or seven years, you could easily do a pomegranate in a container. Now, the thing you want to remember always with any type of container fruit tree planting is uh, as the plant gets larger and you only have that root zone provided by the container, you will be uh, to experience physical stress from excessive summer heat, from Santa Ana winds, from cold winter temperatures, and you only have a, a, a certain size root ball pushing the top of that tree. So for best results and longevity in containers, you want to try and keep the fruiting structure of that plant at no more than about one and a half times the amount of root zone that you've given it to grow. So that management between top and root is what's going to give you longevity and what is going to allow you to prevent against severe physical I'm glad you mentioned espalier. I've actually integrated three varieties of pomegranates into my backyard orchard where there otherwise would be no room for another fruit tree. And through the espalier method, I was able to, again, fit three trees um, that are growing about 10 feet, between 8 and 10 feet tall, but no more than about 18 to 24 inches wide. Um, again, since I've got them tightly compact on a trellis, they still have hundreds of functional branches that will i'm looking forward to hopefully supporting fruit come this upcoming year and i can share that link to my espalier lesson i did about two years ago among other pomegranate lessons um in the video description below and if you can share with us you know in regards to the tree size how you can best control and manage the tree shape 
um, whether it be spring, summer, or fall or winter, when would you recommend um, basically shaping the tree to be that recommended tree size? Well, for you know, for a spellier form or for a more formal uh, form, a hedgerow or something like that, you can do a little bit of work almost all the time on pomegranates. But you want to make sure that you're doing any real uh, substantial, you know, redevelopment or restructuring. Uh, winter pruning should be done during the dormant is uh, dormant in the ground when you're really going to start to work with it and, and do some severe structuring on it. Um, they 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 for formal. Uh, Aspellers, you can do a little bit of snipping to keep them in line, you know, throughout the year. But watch it, you know, when they come into bloom, you want to make sure you're not touching them for their for their whole bloom sequence. So you're going to leave them alone April, May, June, maybe even into July if they're blooming that late. And then you can see where the fruit is setting. And then you can come back in and do a little cleanup work after that where you're not from the plant. I am a huge advocate of mulching. And I think as long as your soil is generally healthy, um, I'm not one for mixing a whole lot of organic material into my backfill. I, I like to use it on the surface as a mulch. But that being said, um, I've, I've done that many, many times in the past, and I haven't had issues with it except for maybe here all those wood products that you're putting into the ground within about a two or three year period, that wood is going to decompose. So what what's happening to that space where that wood is now decomposed into? Where if you... You know, you've created air pockets there in, in the soil. So if you're using uh, native soil and you're, you know, planting on a little bit of a rise and you're using that organic material on the surface as a mulch, you get all the same advantages. You get all that uh, increase in, in bioactivity and mycorrhizal activity. You get the uh, advantage by, you know, a three or four inch layer of mulch, making uh, better use of your irrigation water by 50%. You get... Um, the cool, a little bit of cooling on the soil in the summer, maybe not as important for pomegranates as for some things, but for all of the other attributes of mulching, it, 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 it works right in. Uh, and last but not least, a two or three inch layer of mulch on the surface prevents about 90% of your weed seed termination. So you've got uh, cooling of the soil, you've got better, you've got increased bio and mycorrhizal activity, and you eliminate by 90% one of the worst jobs in the landscape. How can it get any better than that? So, you know, when, when we talk about backyard orchard culture as opposed to commercial orchard culture, you know, people people get caught up in, uh, I want to grow trees like a farmer, when really, when you think about it, you don't want to grow trees like a farmer. You know, you don't need 350 pounds of uh, peaches off your peach tree that are all going to ripen up in a two or three week period of time. A farmer would want to grow all of his fruit to ripen up at one time or several different blocks to ripen up at one time. He wants to go in and pick 30 or 40 or 50 acres of one nectarine or a peach or a pear or an apple, whatever he's doing, and he wants to get that fruit processed into market. So a farmer wants all his fruit at one time, where you, as a backyard orchardist, that'd be the worst possible situation. You don't want, you can only use so much fruit every week. So what a backyard grower wants is completely the opposite. We don't want a lot of fruit today. We want a little bit of fruit all the time. So depending on what kind of a climate you're in, I know for us here in Southern California, I can walk out into my backyard any day out of the year and, and pick something. There's always different things that are ripe out there. So, uh, and, and, and if you don't have a, a, a full uh, season like we do out here and you have the, the true, you know, four different seasons of the year, there may be, you know, the winter months or sometime when you're not really going to have a whole lot available but you want to make the best use of the time that you have good crop of fruit so you're always looking for a little fruit at, at all, all the time instead of a lot of fruit at any one given time that's probably the most important concept of backyard orchard culture is successive ripening uh second most important concept would be control tree size so it's manageable for you and i'm never going to be the one that's going to tell you how big your tree should be because everybody has a different management strategy everybody has a different uh, size plant or tree that, that that they can work with. So it works for you. And especially on things like peach, plum, nectarine, apricot, uh, cherries, that are only ripe for a two or three week window. I don't need a tree that's any bigger than seven or eight feet. I don't want a tree that's any bigger than seven or eight feet. If I'm only going to get two weeks worth of fruit off it, I want to be able to do that work from standing on the ground. So I can come in and prune, I can come in and harvest, I can come in and thin, do all that work from a comfortable, you know, flat spot on the ground. 
Now, there are certainly exceptions on some of my, my avocado varieties where the fruit holds on the tree for several months. I'm okay to manage a tree that's a little bit bigger. I can manage a 15-foot avocado tree with a 10-foot pole and a basket picker. And, you know, uh, quite frankly, I want more than 50 avocados. So on things like that, where the fruit's going to hang for three or four or five months, uh, I, I want a bigger crop and I can go out every week and pick a dozen fruit and I have uh, fruit for the next few days and go out the next week and do the same thing again. So control tree size so it's manageable for you and so you get the maximum you can use for your backyard orchard, for your family and friends. Uh, another very important concept is grow varieties that are adaptable to your climate, uh, your soil type, and varieties that you like and will use. You know, it doesn't do you any good to grow something if you don't like the fruit or have a use for the fruit. It doesn't do you any good to try and grow a Bing cherry tree in Manhattan Beach, California, or uh, a solo papaya a tree in Boise, Idaho, you know, in a greenhouse condition or in a condition where you can provide what they need naturally to be able to fruit, you want to stick to varieties that are adaptable to your climate. So that's, that's where it makes sense in working with a professional nursery, a professional horticulturalist, somebody that understands your climate, understands your soils, understands what varieties are going to do well in the area. And um, oftentimes, uh, some of the bigger chain stores don't pay a whole lot of attention to that. But I guarantee you, every independent retail nursery in, in the United States attention to that. So, you know, those are three things that are really important. You know, work with a good horticulturalist, grow what you like and what you use, what's adaptable to your climate, control tree size so it's manageable for you, and, you know, manage those trees in a, in a style that works for you. Pomegranates would basically hold for about a month to a month and a half. So, you know, they're going to give you a little more hang time than, than most uh, stone fruits would. Uh, but, and, and that's good because, you know, unless you're going to make a gallon of juice and freeze it, there really isn't any reason to have all your pomegranates harvested at the same time. So when you start to see bright color and you start to see size on, on some of the, the best quality fruit on the tree, or three of the best ones, you try them out. If they're good, you go back and get some more. If, they're, if the flavor's not quite there yet, then you can let them hang for a little bit longer. But, you know, remember, flavor's all relative to the variety. So... If you uh, if you pick a Parfianca or a, or a Eversweet and it's delicious and you pick a Wonderful and say, well, it's not there yet, that's just the nature of the beast. It's not going to give you that sweet, punchy flavor like a Parfianca or an Eversweet would. It's going to give you more of an, an astringent, uh, dark, dark, you know, probably very high in antioxidant, but may not be the most pleasant thing to drink. So, you know, choose your varieties wisely. Choose your varieties for a purpose. Now, when it comes to feeding, you mentioned that you start improving the soil conditions with, you know, feeding the soil, the garden soil, start building up the microbial life in your garden soils and making the elements available for the plants to succeed going into the spring season. Can you explain um, feeding and fertilizing your fruit trees going into the entire calendar year? How would that, what would that look like for you? So my, my philosophy on, on fruit trees has always been the first couple of years, you know, when you're establishing size and, and production structure on a tree, I'm going to give it something that's a little higher in nitrogen. You know, not real high. I don't want a triple 15 or a sulfate of ammonia or something like that. But I want a balanced fertilizer where the N and the P and the K are, are on, on a, almost an even level and maybe have some tray manganese. That's going to give you strong root system. It's going to give you good quick structure so you can develop your fruiting body. After a couple of years or maybe third year in the ground, I'm going to change gears. At that point, I've got a six or seven or an eight foot tree. I've got a nice healthy structure. I've got a well-developed root system. And at that point, I want to convert it over from a, a growth mode to a blooming and fruiting mode. So I'm going to switch fertilizers at that point. I'm going to go with something that's going to be a little bit lower in nitrogen and maybe higher in the, with, with trace elements, zinc, iron, manganese, those Im important things in very, very small percentages. And, and that is going to help me to keep that root system strong, it's going to give me enough nitrogen so that I get a little bit of vigor. I get good, uh, you know, good green foliage still. But what it's really going to do is it's going to give me a strong extended bloom season. And if we don't get bloom, we don't get fruit. And one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they just feed with a nitrogen or they overwater their trees. And they, you know, they'll get it. Hey, I got an apricot tree that grew out ten feet. You know, and I know it's healthy it's as green as can be and it gets the same water as the lawn 
and the gardener throws sulfate of ammonia on it. What's wrong? Well, you just explain me, you know, strike one, strike two, strike three. Number one, it's in a lawn area. Number two, you're irrigating it like a lawn. And number three, you're feeding it like a lawn. And you're expecting it to do something other than just green, vigorous growth. It has no, no stability. It has no uh, uh, reason to produce uh, a strong flower wood because it's just that you want fruit. You cut back on the nitrogen. You go with the high P and the K. You make sure you got some trace elements. And then you're going to convert that tree over into, into a, a strong flower set. And that strong, long period of flower set so that we have many days that are, that are preferable. If it only has three or four days worth of flower set and they're all rainy days, you're not going to get much fruit. But if you've got three weeks and you've got one week in there where it's, you know, beautiful early spring weather, you're going to get plenty of cross pollinization and plenty. And I know something else you also teach occasionally from year to year, and we've been teaching for many years together, is you generally share in your education of fruit tree care, the value of whitewashing. And I know people can fertilize properly and mulch properly and water properly and do all these things properly, um, but they've never heard of what whitewashing is. Could you share what whitewashing is and what the value is that whitewashing offers your plants in the winter compared to summer months? Well, and, and that's a great point, Charles. And I think, you know, as I remember back, some of our very first conversations were, uh, you know, wintertime and summertime stress protection, you know, sunburn protection and sun skull protection. And um, I, I am, I'm an advocate, you know, you know that. I mean, I, I, everything that gets planted in my landscape gets whitewashed the, uh, the day that it goes in. And then I'm always looking at structure. I'm always, if I'm doing excessive pruning or if I'm, um, you know, thinning out, doing my winter pruning and thinning out the wood, I'm going to come back in and whitewash those trees uh, almost every year, especially things that are tender like avocados. You know, the nine out of 10 avocado trees that die in the landscape die because they, they get sun scald and they, they're never able to recover from that. That tender, fleshy green bark absolutely has to be protected. And, you know, you're, I, I've been using your product now for, for many years and, and I, I love it. It works out, you know, very, very well. It gives you a really nice, uh, strong coating. You can, you can cut it a little bit more with water if you want to dilute it down just a bit. You don't want a real heavy coating on there, but I'm, I'm using it, you know, on my avocados every year. Um, apples and peaches and nectarines every year right after winter pruning. And, you know, for pomegranates, I think it would be beneficial. You know, you do your winter pruning, you get your structure, and you can mix it up. And, you know, you could even mix it up in a spray bottle and just spray it on the structure. And, and you know, you can do that whole thing in 30 seconds instead of standing out there with a paintbrush for half an hour. Correct. And Ivory Organics is proud to share that there's an organic alternative that's Armory certified for both organic commercial orchards as well as backyard orchard growers to be doing the right thing with an organic formula. And when it comes to summer sunburn, that's one protection, but actually most commercial orchards across the country are protecting their plants in late fall from the more damaging effects of what winter sun scald can do to your plants with the damaging freeze while the roots are still insulated, you know, below ground level. Um, and that disparity in that extreme is another stress on the plant that, um, again, the majority of commercial orchard growers are basically whitewashing their plants to protect them from winter damage um, almost as much so as the value that whitewashing brings to plants in the summer. So if you have some more questions for Tom Spellman, I'm encouraging all of you that have not done so already to join the Fruit Tube YouTube channel, subscribe, hit the push bell notification to stay informed of all of their educational lessons as soon as they become released. And then if you have any questions, feel free to write questions down there. Tom Spellman and his team will be more than happy to help answer your questions. And another way to also get in touch with them is through the Dave Wilson Nursery Instagram as well. Um, be sure to join, follow their education there as well, and feel free to write questions there as well. I'm also happy to answer any of your questions below. You can write your questions or comments below. I'd be happy to answer your questions personally. If you've enjoyed this lesson brought to you by Ivory Organics, be sure to give us that thumbs up. Share us with your gardening friends and family. For those of you that are new, also be sure to subscribe and hit that push bell notification. As always, keep growing with Ivory Organics and wishing you all happy gardening. Thank you, Charles. Always appreciate the opportunity to work with you. Uh, good friends, good health, good fruit. <laughs> Sounds great.